the best way I know how to kind of explain it, and this is the way I explain it to myself, is you, know, you got to think of a car, right? Mm-hmm. Like a car sometimes needs routine maintenance, right? When you need routine maintenance, who you take it to? Who you take it right. to the mechanic? Yeah. Well, just like us, our spiritual souls need routine maintenance. Mm-hmm. Well, who do we go to? We got to go back to the Father. Yeah. And then there, you know, your your oil gets changed. You know, the transmission gets looked at. Everything kind of gets looked over. Stay away from the mechanic long enough. Right. Engine's going to blow up. Yeah. Well, same thing happens in our spiritual life. We stay away from God too long and we don't right. include him in those, that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eventually it's going to crater. Episode four. I'm excited. It's been yeah, a while. It's been a minute. It has, but uh, excited to be back, man. We got a new kind of setup we're trying out, so hopefully nice. this this works out well for us. You did a good job here in the high school room. Yeah, I really like it. It's really nice. The high schoolers like it. That's but. cool. It's definitely conducive to um, a good young adult learning environment. Yeah, I'm excited to have our next gen class being starting this Wednesday for our juniors and seniors to get them well equipped for uh going into young adult ministry when they graduate high school so that's um, awesome it's gonna be a good thing yeah so but my head's itching yeah (laughs) (laughs) do you ever wear a hat for a while and your your hair just starts or your head just starts to itch really bad yeah and it's like always in the front right yeah is that how it works for you yeah well i think because when i put this hat on the little fabric it's supposed to, I guess, keep everything in place. It always slips down. Mm. Yeah. Hat hair is never fun. No. But speaking of hair, I went and got a haircut this past week. And is there ever been something that a barber will say to you where you're just like, ooh, man, you really just annihilated my hair? Yeah. For me, it was she got done cutting my hair, looked in the mirror while I, I was looking in the mirror at my haircut. And she said, do you want me to put some gel on your cowlick? <laughs> I'm like, oh, gosh, you butchered the backside, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> like, you, yeah. I'm gonna walk out of here looking like Alfalfa in his 30s and yeah. like just let go of himself because you cut my hair wa- wrong. <laughs> I haven't gone to a barber since I was in high school. Man, what was that like? Who'd you go to? There was a joint <coughs> you released the seal. Yeah. I'm good. There was this place uh, everybody went to. It's called the Cutting Edge. And um, I don't know, went all growing up. And then when I got to high school, uh, is when I decided to cut my own hair. Only because haircuts started getting really expensive. And I mean, there were seven bucks. They went up to 10 bucks, then 12 bucks. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was a lot of money. It didn't sound like a lot of money now, but. Uh, still a lot of money. But I I wanted to get my hair cut every week. I just can't stand having long hair. Yeah. I just don't think I look good um, with it. Which is funny because all through middle school uh, and up to my freshman year of high school, I had long hair. Like wrap it back in a ponytail type long hair. And so uh, when I got it short, I just I didn't want to pay that much money every single week. So decided to cut it myself. And it was not pretty. The first time around, <laughs> me and my buddy, uh, we have a, uh, we have a uh, funny stories. We wanted to get, we wanted to get a straight line, you know, when you're doing the, uh, the fade. So we get a baseball hat and we'd put it backwards and then we'd try to line this up as much as we could. And then we would just follow the line here. It, uh, it didn't work it, it, at all. <laughs> <laughs> so you took it down to nothing, right? No. And then there's, there was this one time when. I went super high on his fade, and uh, it just looked like he had a landing strip. You pushed it back. (laughs) Oh, man. It was horrible. Gave him a cul-de-sac before he was ready. (laughs) And then I made the mistake, after I butchered his haircut, I made the mistake of trusting him (laughs) to cut mine next. And, dude, he got that clipper, and he just buzzed me right here. And so I had a big bald spot for about two weeks. Oh, man. Right there. I just owned it. I said, yeah, we messed up. I had a 
I had a good buddy of mine. I let cut my hair one time because uh, I couldn't afford a, uh, to go to the barber. And so I told him, I was like, man, I like an eight on the sides and then just kind of kind of even it out on top. He just heard eight and just <laughs> right down the middle. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> Nicest guy in the world, but easy top three worst haircuts just, I've ever got. Yeah. He just took the lawnmower to your head. Yeah, basically. <laughs> but I like short hair, but I hate short hair when you go to bed. Because, like, I sleep on my stomach, mm-hmm. and so I always wake up with that, like, wave. Bed you head? Know? Yeah. You ever you ever had that happen when you, like, take a nap? You I keep like, my hair short enough where it doesn't really affect me. Mm. But, yeah. Well, it'll affect me if I keep gelling it. Because mm. I'll gel my hair just to spike it up a bit. Yeah. If I don't wash it out before I take a nap or go to bed, then I wake up and it just... I don't know. It's not dandruff, but like dry gel. I don't know. What, yeah. I don't know what you call it. In Spanish, we would say caspa. I have no <laughs> idea what that means. So, yeah. So, you get a bunch of caspa on your head. Mm. And so, it's basically, you know, dry gel. When you start to rub it out, it turns all white and it looks like you got a whole bunch of dandruff mm. all over your head. So, that's what it looks like. And then it's on the pillow and then you got to watch the pillowcase. And... Yeah. Yeah. No, mine usually just gets that kind of cool wave looking thing. And then it looks usually it'll get like kind of smashed up on the side because I sleep with my arm like that. Yeah. But it's only usually after those like after church naps, right? Like, mm-hmm. There's just something about an after church nap where it just. Yeah. Those are just, next level. Yes. It's smacked. Yeah. Those are just amazing lap, uh, naps and like. And just good rest is always something that just you wake up from and you feel refreshed, right? Yeah. You know? That's a great segue. Yeah. Into what we're talking about today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is. And so, you know, speaking of speaking of like like rest and taking good naps, right? Like so we took a break from the podcast during December and January. Mm-hmm. Um, but during December, like you went on a sabbatical. Yeah. And so like what did what did that look like? What did God kind of do during that time? And, and just kind of like how, how much was that rest needed? Do you feel? It was um, probably one of the best things um, that I could have ever done in ministry is take some intentional time uh, to get away, mm. which is kind of unheard of outside of pastoral ministry. Yeah. People don't normally know what a sabbatical is or if they know what a sabbatical is they don't really quite understand why is someone afforded a sabbatical yeah Uh, but in pastoral ministry that's the norm yeah after so many years of um depending on your context five years seven years ten years the church provides for you um the opportunity to take some extended leave yeah you know call it People call it an extended vacation, extended leave, well, leave of absence, whatever. But it's a sabbatical. And the sole purpose of the sabbatical is not just so that you would spend some time doing nothing. But ultimately, in your doing nothing, you would find rest in the Lord. Yeah. Not just in rest from naps, which are great, praise God, or hobbies or getting away from the routine of things. But that in that time, you're seeking after the Lord. Um, and that's what I experienced. Um of course, there's a lot of things that really led up to that. There's a lot of different things that happened that I recognized that were kind of buried deep. Some mm-hmm. things I needed to repent of. Um, but man, overall, the sabbatical was, it was huge. Yeah. And I liked what you said about like people outside of ministry normally don't understand what a sabbatical is. And like they feel kind of almost like when they hear about it, it's like, oh, well, the pastor's just going on a vacation. Mm-hmm. But that's not what it is. Like, you know, and so, like, do you kind of want to unpack that a little bit more for those that may not truly understand what sabbatical looks yeah, like? And yeah, yeah. Kind of what pastoral ministry, the weight right. of it kind of looks yeah. like. That's good because, I mean, I'll just basically share what kind of, like, led up to it. So, we don't, like our church, we don't, well, now, after this, we'll, we'll have a sabbatical policy in place. But we didn't have a sabbatical poly, policy in place up until at least two months ago. Um, and so, <clears throat> I mean, you remember, it was back in October when I just started having issues preaching on stage. Yeah. Um, heart rate started racing really crazy up to the point where I had to stop preaching. Couldn't catch my breath. I just felt my mind, my body just felt 
different, felt mm-hmm. weird. Now, I guess about three years ago, four years ago now, back in 2020, I started experiencing pretty massive anxiety. Um, I got help for it, um, started getting on some anxiety medication. And that was really um, really helpful. But what I was experiencing back in October, I didn't really put my finger on it as anxiety because it wasn't what I had felt before. It just felt different. Mm. And especially because my heart would start racing in random moments. And so my immediate reaction was, and am I having a heart attack? Yeah. Am I having some heart issues here? Um, and so, so then what I ended up doing is I ended up approaching the personnel team and the servant leaders and um, requesting some time off in order to basically assess, man, what's going on. Yeah. Because it was enough of a scare on Sunday morning, two weeks in a row, to have to stop in the middle of a sermon, to sit down, catch my breath, and then to battle through the rest of the message. When you, when you ever preach, when you're preaching, are you having like some secondary thoughts rolling through your mind? Oh, yeah. You know, normally it's like, you know, you're preaching, you're reading a Bible verse, you're sharing your main point, but you see, oh, okay, so-and-so's napping. Right, so and so is probably looking on their phone, yeah, and all that's kind of running in the background, right? It's kind of the normal part of of preaching when you have that vantage point. But when I started experiencing those things, those those two weeks on stage, I'm preaching and I'm battling through, thinking, "Am I dying? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what what's going to happen if this is a real health issue? You know, if am I going to have a heart attack on stage?" Um, is what, what's going to become of my family? My mark, my mind starts to go to those, those really dark places, yeah. you know? And so anyways, uh, so I approached the personnel team. I approached the servant leaders um, and I asked them uh, for some time off. I said, I don't know what's going on. Um, I need to really um, assess what's, what's happening with my health. And outside of, of what happened on those two Sunday mornings, I really started to experiencing my mind started to go to some really dark places, Mm. like some really dark thoughts um, in my mind. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night, my heart would be racing um, and I would just feel numb. My fingertips would feel numb. uh, The soles of my feet would feel numb. And I I just knew something's not right in my body. And then it was a Saturday morning when um, I woke up, I made me a pot of coffee and um, sat down to study. And the episode hit me again and it just, it hit me really, really hard. And Crystal and I had already had some errands planned uh, for that day. And so I just try to battle through it. I'm mm-hmm. like, man, let me just try and white knuckle grip this and, and see if it'll just kind of go away on its own. Well, it didn't. So we ended up in the emergency room later that afternoon. And I basically said, I just want to make sure I'm not having a heart attack. And so they ran tests at an EKG and they said, man, everything, everything looks okay. Um, and so that was kind of like the catalyst um, or that was kind of like the final nail where I said, man, I, I, I really got to get this under control. If they're saying everything looks okay, well, they did recommend you probably should follow up with a cardiologist yeah, and do some more thorough testing, make sure everything is okay. And so that's what we did. And so I think the middle of November and it came on pretty quick. So it was like from, from one Sunday to a Tuesday. So I requested from personnel team and servant leaders on a Sunday. And then on Tuesday, they were meeting, called me up and said, um, hey, you pick the day and time and you take a break. And so um, I think I started that next week. Yeah. Uh, if I remember, because we yeah. announced it to the church that following Sunday. And then, um, yeah, it took 36 days, which I think lined up really well because that went into the Christmas celebration, which then we normally take a little bit of time off for Christmas anyway. Yeah. So that 36 days, if you count the Christmas holidays kind of extended into about 45 days. Um, and so that was really, really helpful. And through all that time I'm praying, um, seeing my doctor, um, running tests. I'm trying to get into the cardiologist, which I found out takes a long time yeah so all this is back in the middle of november i don't get to see a cardiologist until the middle of january and so that whole time there's just a lot of thoughts racing um, through my mind is this is this heart related is it not 
And so, uh, man, I just really start seeking the Lord. Um, and I just really start pressing into him in a way that I really forgot, um, in a way that I had stopped in a very, very, very long time. And so, you know, when people think of pastoral ministry, when they think of pastors, right, we know the jokes all the time. You only work one day a week, yep. you know? Um, but there's so much behind the scenes that people don't realize or recognize. Yeah. There is a huge weight and a huge spiritual burden that is casted on the shoulders and the heart of pastors. Mm-hmm. Um, a weight that unless people walk in those shoes will really never, I don't think truly grasp um, and really understand the weight of it. And so it's a heavy burden to bear. And that burden, um, if, if it is not navigated correctly, um, can have detrimental effects. Yeah. And I think that's what I went through, you know? Um, Let me just stop real quick and say that I love being a pastor. Yeah. And I love serving at the Grove. And I tell I tell our church all this all the time. The Grove is the best church I've ever served at. Yeah. And um man, outside of a clear sign from the Lord, um I mean my family and I, we hope we hope to retire from the Grove. We hope the Grove is the last church that we ever serve at. Hope this is the last church I ever pastor. But even at that, I mean, even as wonderful as any church is, I mean, there's still burdens that you bear. Mm-hmm. You know? Um I love a church, but you, well, I mean, we know this. There's, there's not a week that goes by where we are not hearing something yeah. from someone. Yeah. And, and, and it's not a bad thing. That's what we want. We are a place with open doors for people to come and share their hurts, to share their pain, to share their criticism. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we want. We want people to know that's what the church is here for. We want to love on you. We want to hold your hand. Um, we want to weep with you. We want to rejoice with you. But at the end of the day, I mean, those those become burdens that we bear. Yeah. Um, and so I think after eight years of, of serving here, um, I really start to feel the effects of that, which then became physical um, in the terms of uh, the rapid heart rate, the high blood pressure and all of that. And so during the sabbatical, we're trying to get into the cardiologist. And, and now that I have a break from the day in and day out routine and rhythms of a pastor. It, it, it took me about a, a about two weeks to kind of get into a steady rhythm. Up until then, I'm still experiencing those symptoms. Yeah. Rapid heart rate, very high blood pressure, waking up in the middle of the night, my fingertips are numb, all of that. Um, and then about week three, I, man, I start to go to a really, really dark place again. Um, and it got scary. It scared me enough that I decided I, I need to get back on my anxiety medication. And so, so that's what I did. I, I doubled up on it. Um, I got it into my system very rapidly, and then, and then I cut back on it. Uh, I'm still on it. And I kid you not, man, it was like from one moment to the next um, that, that it just it shifted for me. Yeah. Um, and so, so then that, that began to kind of relieve me a bit to think, okay, maybe it was just massive anxiety that I was dealing with. Maybe it's not heart related and maybe I'm okay. Like in that regard. Yeah. Um, So we finally get in to see the, um, the cardiologist, uh, he runs some tests, got to wear a heart monitor uh, and all of that. And uh, basically he says, man, everything looks great. We want to run some more tests. We want to be thorough, make sure everything's good. But, um, man, everything looks great. I wouldn't really worry about this being a heart issue. And then I'm seeing my doctor still and all of that, you know, and um, you know, telling him about all these uh, things that I'm, I'm feeling. And, uh, and so we just kind of conclude it's probably just massive anxiety that I was uh, internalizing and then just really kind of manifested itself out yeah. in those symptoms. And then so... Going back to, man, I'm seeking the Lord and I'm really pressing into him. And I begin to realize, right, even outside of anxiety, I begin to realize that in in my ministry, and, and this is true, not just for pastors, this is true for any believer in Jesus. You can kind of get caught in a rut. Mm-hmm. And 
and you can just kind of stay there. Yeah. And, and you realize you can kind of stay there. And if you're not pushing hard against the grain, but if you're not hitting the brakes too hard, you can kind of go at a steady pace and you can just kind of slide along and, and things can kind of be okay. Um, and I think I just kind of got comfortable there. And so, so for example, um, the, the Lord just started convicting me. And when, it, when I say there's some things I need to repent of, this is what I was talking about. I started to realize when it came. So I'm, I'm very diligent when it comes to studying the Bible, when it comes to sermon preparation and all of that. And so though I remained diligent in studying the scriptures for the sermon uh, on Sunday morning, I realized in the sabbatical, man, when was the last time I really prayed? Mm. Lord, bless your word. Yeah. Lord, let this sermon, let this message bring life change to somebody. But when was the last time I did that? Started on a Monday morning in preparation for, for the Sunday message. And I realized, man, I had not done that. And then I started to realize, man, I, I've, I've really been doing this in my own strength. I've really been trying to rely on my own ability. And so it makes sense that if I'm going to attempt in my own strength to preach the glory of God through his word, that I'm going, my body's going to respond that way because I'm not leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that, that's kind of, I mean, we can flesh that out more, but that's kind of in a nutshell what, what I learned and experienced through sabbatical. I'm extremely grateful for it. And uh, I've been telling people this, if I had to summarize what I learned and experienced in one sentence was um, I developed a greater passion for seeking after the Lord that I had not experienced in a very long time. I'd say years. And so my prayer life over the last two, three months has been completely different. Um, the way I engage and study for a message has been completely different. And all of that is because I was provided the opportunity to have intentional rest. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll just say this. Um, I'm grateful for the sabbatical but I didn't need a sabbatical to come to that realization if I had continued to remain diligent and intentional in pursuing the Lord. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's why, I mean, that's why the Lord commands, right? Honor the Sabbath. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, you said this the other day, it's, it's one of the only spiritual disciplines that is part of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Um, and that honoring the Sabbath is not honoring a particular day. It's finding your rest in Jesus. Well, I mean, even even in Genesis, like when God finishes creation, like it's one of the the seventh days, one of the few days where He says, "And it was good." Yeah, right. Like, like rest. Like God didn't need to rest after creation; He did it to show us that we need rest, right? And to display to us, like mm -hmm. I created all of this for you. Yeah. And I created this for you to be blessed by. And rest is you taking in those moments and realizing there is a God that created all this mm -hmm. and he created me. And then your mind begins to kind of go like, then the scripture just comes alive of, man, he even formed my inward parts. Right. And, you know, I'm the, I'm the clay in the potter's hands. Mm -hmm. And you begin to just see how magnificent and huge God is and, you know, rest is, is to me became, you know, ever since just uh, l last year when I started really studying on it and just, you know, read a few of the books that you recommended, just, man, I realized like rest was the one thing I wasn't really being intentional about, Yeah, you know, and, and, and like what you said about prayer too, like, I feel like that's a, that's a trap that a lot of pastors can step off into is just, getting so caught up and and I got to get the sermon ready for Sunday or I got to mm -hmm. get ready for Wednesday night or I got to get ready for Bible study or I got to get ready for this and you know I got to be prepared for this or I got to be prepared for that that you get so caught up in the doing that you get you forget about the resting and right the that's such a good way of putting it because that's what I feel um was happening in my life I was so caught up in the doing that I forgot about the importance of just being in the Lord mm. Yeah, And I think that pendulum can swing to two extremes. Yes. Because there are people that are so caught up in doing things for the Lord. And they're doing the right things for the Lord. Yes. They're serving in ministry. 
they're being good parents, they're being uh, a good husband, a good wife, they're doing all these great things, but just like I did, you get caught in this rut, and then you just unintentionally, because no one who, who generally wants to seek the Lord wakes up and says, I just want to hit cruise control, Yeah, and I don't want to pursue the Lord. Like No one who's genuinely seeking after Jesus wakes up and says that. But because of just the rhythm of life, because of seasons of life, you unintentionally find yourself in that area. And if you don't recognize it immediately, I mean, you can find yourself years down the road and then eventually realize after the tower comes tumbling down, man, I've, I've, I've been in this season for a very, very long time yeah. where I'm just on cruise control. Um, and so it's very easy to fall into that rut. The best way I know how to kind of explain it, and this is the way I explain it to myself, is you, know, you got to think of a car, right? Mm-hmm. Like a car sometimes needs routine maintenance, right? When you need routine maintenance, who you take it to? Who you take it right. to the mechanic? Yeah. Well, just like us, our spiritual souls need routine maintenance. Mm-hmm. Well, who do we go to? We got to go back to the Father. Yeah. And then there, you know, your your oil gets changed. You know, the transmission gets looked at. Everything kind of gets looked over. Stay away from the mechanic long enough. Right. Engine's going to blow up. Yeah. Well, same thing happens in our spiritual life. We stay away from God too long and we don't right. include him in those, that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eventually it's going to crater. Right. Right. And, and we're going to hit those, those lulls and those moments and those ruts where yeah. you yeah. begin to realize like, oh snap, like there's a lot of warning lights on the dash that I just, right. I put tape over and didn't, yes. it, it didn't pretend they're like, not there. Exactly. Yeah. Because we feel that man, if, if I stop, yeah. If I stop what I'm doing, then, then who's going to do it? Yeah. You know? Um, and it, that's why I think it's so important. Um, and, and I've preached on this before, but, but now I'm at, because of sabbatical, I'm actually realizing the importance of living it. Why seasonally families need to take breaks from things. Yes. Um, we we're not made to go 100 miles per hour all the time. Yeah. And, and that's my nature. That's my DNA. Crystal will tell you, um, there, there are seldom moments, even even on weekends, even on vacation times, where where I'm, I'm doing nothing, right? It just it's just my makeup, it's my DNA. I have to be doing something all the time. But again, that goes back to we find ourselves swinging so far to just doing that we forget about being. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I, I think the opposite side of that pendulum is we can spend so much time just being that we're just not doing anything. Yeah. You become complacent. Yeah. And so you got to find that healthy balance, which is what we're getting at. That's where finding your rest in the Lord mm-hmm. helps you walk that balance. Um, and I wanted to mention this, right? Rest. When you're resting in the Lord, when you're experiencing that Sabbath moment, whether it's in the form of a sabbatical, um, which was a huge blessing, or it's a weekend getaway, or it's taking the morning or the afternoon out of your day to say, I want to be intentional about Sabbathing in the Lord. That it's not just about taking a nap, though it, it includes that. Yeah. It's not just about watching your favorite TV show, though that can be included, but mainly it's about seeking God. And so one of the things that I did, just kind of give some handles for some people, is um, though I had always been in the Word every day, I, I really started reading the scripture for myself, if that makes any sense. No, it does. Because in pastoral ministry, it's very easy to study the scripture, but I'm studying it for a purpose because I got a lesson to teach. I got a sermon to preach or, or something like that. But during the sabbatical, I wasn't teaching. I wasn't preaching. And so I really started experiencing, man, what it is to study the scriptures for myself. Yeah. There's no reason for me to study the scriptures other than I just want to draw closer to the Lord. There, there wasn't a bigger agenda beyond right. just, I want to personally grow in my walk mm-hmm. with the Lord. Yeah. And, and I, I think you hit it really well when you said like, that's very easy for pastors to fall into that. Cause you know, it can be very, very simple for a lot of people in pastoral ministry or just in ministry in general to go, well, I'm putting a lesson together every week. So obviously I'm growing in my walk with the Lord. Right. Like, yeah, you're growing in your understanding, but mm-hmm. How is that affecting your daily walk? Right. What does that look like? Yeah. You know, because there's a lot more to it than just preparing for a lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about uh, drinking from a fountain, not just to share with others, which is admirable, 
and beautiful, and that's part of the Great Commission. But you need to drink from the fountain for yourself first. Yes. Because when you're healthy, then, I mean, that, that that's all the more effective when you're sharing that fountain with others. Yeah. Pouring from an empty cup mm. means you're giving nothing to anybody. Yeah. Right? I say that like, way better than I could. That's like, so good. Like, and I feel like that's what happens. And I feel like that's why, you know, I want to, I want to say too, like, like since you've come back from that sabbatical, like there's just, I don't know how to explain it, but there's a different passion that comes out on when you preach Sunday mornings and just, you can tell that it's not just, Hey, I'm relaying information, mm-hmm. but man, this, and not that it wasn't before, but just, it's, it's more evident now of, yeah. man, this impacted me this week and I want it to impact your mm-hmm. life too. And I want you to understand the transformational work that Christ can do in your life. Yeah. You know, and just, it just seems like there's this renewed spirit and just like you and God are perfectly in step now. Mm-hmm. Not that you weren't ever out of step or, or miscued in any way, but just, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just. Right. And, and it, it, that's the whole purpose of the sabbatical, particularly sabbaticals that are afforded and provided for pastors mm-hmm. because the data, the statistics show that your pastor comes back with renewed vigor, with renewed passion. And the church is going to be all the more blessed by that. It's not just, it's a, it's a huge blessing for the pastor, but it's also a huge blessing for the church yes. because the church gets to be on the receiving end of what that sabbatical provided. And so, I think all of that also goes back to this renewed passion for prayer and preparation and calling upon the name of the Lord. And so before, um, especially given the social media digital age, it's very easy to get caught up in, oh man, I want, I want my three points to sound. Uh, I want them to be tweetable lines. Yeah. Um, I want them to stick. I want them to hit. And while I, I believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm pro-creativity when it comes to sermon preparation and delivering all of that. I, I think God has gifted people to be creative, and I think they have to flex that gift and use their creativity um, in how they preach. But I think also, if we're not careful and if we're not intentional, then we can really lean on our own strengths and not lean onto the Lord. And I think that's kind of where I fell. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, there'd be moments where I approach a sermon and I'd say, man, well, I got to say it this way. So that way it'll stick. And the desire is genuine. You want, well, it, I want it to be memorable for people. Yeah. I want them to remember that. But I mean, if that's absent of God, like seeking the Lord first, then then I think we miss it. And so now when I approach the message, my prayer, my prayer is simple. I think it's simple is, Lord, I want this to be your word and not mine. And I have. Or what does Paul say? I don't need to speak in eloquent words. Mm-hmm. I just need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's what I want. I just want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And if you're faithful to the word of God, like God's going to be faithful to his promises. It'll it'll hit the hearts it needs to hit. Mm-hmm. And right. it'll it'll fall upon the ears that need to hear it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the one thing that always sticks out to me is just the whole, you know, verse that always talks about, you know, the word will not return void. Right. Right. Like if, if we're just faithful to the text, faithful to the word, like God's going to do something with that, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and God's going to, God's going to pierce hearts and God's going to change lives. Yeah. You know, we may, we may never see that change. We may never see that, that light bulb go off in somebody's Mm -hmm. eyes, but we know that that seed was planted yes and that's god's going to be faithful to water that seed Mm -hmm. and god's going to be faithful to provide that growth right you know like he talks about in first corinthians you know like paul's talking about him and apollos he's like you know it's neither me nor apollos like god god's gonna do it right like we neither one of us can say oh well i did that no yeah and i think you said it beautiful yesterday too in your message where it's just like it doesn't matter about the messenger. The message is going to go. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter who it goes through. Right. Like, yeah. As long as you're filled with the spirit, faithful to the word, God's going to do the work. And I think that point you bring up is is so good because that's something else that I realized on sabbatical was there's a freedom that exists. Well, let me back up a bit. 
So the burdens that that pastors bear, that really church leaders bear, is it's a heavy burden because you're caring for the souls of people. Mm-hmm. You're shepherding your congregation. You're wanting them to grow in the Lord. Um, you hurt when they hurt, when they experience pain. And, and it's a hurt like no other because your family, you're united by your bonds uh, um, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there's there's a hurt when other people are hurting. Of course, there's a rejoicing when other people are rejoicing. But you care so, we care so deeply for the souls of our people that we hurt for them. Mm-hmm. And, and we desire so much for them to grow in their faith or for people who are in the community um, who attend church nominally or who been attending church for a while, but they've never made a profession of faith. We get burdened for them all the more. Like if, if you would just come to Jesus. And so there was a part of me that the reason I wanted to be clever in sermon delivery, message preparation, all of that was my sights were set, man, if, if only they could get it. Yeah. If only they can come to know Jesus, which at the end of the day, that's the work of God. Yeah. He bore that burden and he took it to Calvary. He took it on the cross and he rose from the grave and he sits in glory. And he's the one that does the work of changing hearts. We can't change hearts. We can't make people put faith in Jesus. Only thing we could do is be faithful to the message. Yep. That's it. And so, I kind of came back to that reality in sabbatical that while I want to continue to strive and do the best I can and try my hardest to bring people to Christ at the end of the day, that's not my burden to bear in this sense. I can't change their hearts for them. I simply need to just be faithful to the word. Yeah. And Jesus is going to do the work. The Holy Spirit's going to do what the Holy Spirit does, which is bring conviction. And sometimes when you're not seeing that fruit, I mean, that could be, that can be hard to deal with. Yeah. But it's freeing when you understand, man, the word of God doesn't return void, right? Seeds are being planted and, and God's going to raise up someone to continue that ministry when we're long gone. Um, so that's a freeing, a freeing thing to recognize. Yeah. And I like too how you said earlier, like that pendulum can swing from like being very diligent in your doing and like serving and just being just a go getter mm-hmm. to where that pendulum can swing all the way to the other side of I'm 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 good. I'm comfortable. Right. You know, and and you know, before we kinda kinda wrap up this episode, like like that's one thing that I really wanted to talk about too, is because I feel like there's a lot of people out there that are in this, in this, especially in Western culture, mm-hmm. there's this idea of comfort Christianity. Oh yeah, my ticket got punched. I signed the card. I prayed the prayer. I'm good to go. Right. I'm going to heaven. Ain't nothing else I need to do. I don't need to serve in ministry. I just need to show up on church. Right. Make my face be shown and make my face be seen, and then I go home and live my life. Right. Right. And I think I see a lot. So like. Right, like there's a lot of things wrong with that, mm-hmm. right? And I think I think Tozer summed it up well too when he said like basically like like complacency in this idea of comfort, right, is a deadly foe of spiritual growth. Mm. Like you are exactly who Paul is talking to in First Corinthians, who is like, man, y'all still babies, right? Like y'all need to grow up. <laughs> y'all got to move on to some better food. Yeah, exactly. Because like, that's the thing, like salvation initially it tastes so sweet it is it's beautiful it's wonderful but that's that's the first step yeah in a buffet that god has before his people yeah i mean you've got a taste of the milk and the milk's phenomenal oh, man it changed your life it saved you but man, there's baked potato and steak down the line some crab legs lobster <laughs> Like, like there's some good let's stuff get after it yeah um and that's why the scripture says we've got to taste and see how good the Lord is. Yeah. And we miss out on so much. And I feel like that taste and see and a lot of those taste and see moments come when you, (coughs) excuse me, (laughs) effectively roll up your sleeves and get engaged in serving in your local church, Mm -hmm. serving in your community, you know, don't. And, and, and also too, like, like don't serve just because it's like, Oh, I was, I was told I need to serve. Like, 
Right. Like there should be a stirring in the sense mm-hmm. of, oh man, I'm really growing in my relationship with the Lord. I'm, you know, beginning to read his word. I'm becoming more diligent in my, my disciplines and prayer and things yeah. like that and rest to where now I'm, you know, I really want to serve in church and I want to, I want to serve the way that I got served, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I, it's a statistic that has always bothered me, right? Like 10% of the church does 90% of the work, right? Right. Like that's something that's always bugged me because yeah. like Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, like there is so many areas that could use so many right. good people. And I think, but yeah, I think that's the thing. There's, uh, my there's, show is on Wednesday night and I don't want to miss it. <laughs> there's so much going on behind the scenes that I think it's twofold. I think first, I think there are people who legitimately just, I'm not going to do it. Someone else can do it. Yeah. And to that, I say, oh man, you got to reevaluate what it means to serve the Lord. Cause it's not that. Yeah. And then secondly, I think people just don't realize that so much is happening behind the scenes. What you visually see taking place on any program, Wednesday nights uh, and Sunday mornings, like that, that's just a fraction of yeah. all that is happening to make that happen. Yeah. Um, and so there's so much work that goes in. There's so much um, serving um, that needs to happen. And some people just don't know about it because they don't see it. They're not exposed to it, which I think they're, you know, the responsibility falls on us as leaders to continually, number one, remind people, hey, these yeah. are the needs that are happening. But number two, to, to say, hey, you, we're pressing against you and you have to let's go. Yeah. Like you've got to, you've got to serve. You got to be involved. Shepherd them in that yeah. way. There, there are people don't like to hear this, but there, if you are a Christian, there are expectations that are placed on you. Mm-hmm. And if you're a believer in Jesus, and especially if you've chosen to be a member of a local church, then there are spiritual expectations that are placed on you. And that's just not your expectation to believe in Jesus, your expectation to worship Jesus, but your expectation in your worshiping of Jesus to serve your community through the local church. Mm-hmm. And that comes in you serve on the welcome team, serving kids ministry, serving student ministry. Yeah, there's a, a multitude of ministries that people can get involved in. Mm-hmm. And, and that was something that when I first became a Christian, like I, I, I didn't fully understand or grasp like, oh, you just you just basically need another strong back. Like that's the only reason why you're calling me. But then when I got engaged in serving, it's like, no, like, like what you said, like, Oh man, I'm really missing out. Like there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of rejoicing. There's a lot of victory that is found in serving. Mm -hmm. And even on, you know, areas like, like, okay. Student ministry wise, like, man, I didn't realize how much students can relate to even just the symbolic, the simple things that I found hardship in right? just the simplicities of those things and just how getting engaged and getting involved, it caused me to go, okay, God, what's next? What are you trying to reveal to me in these moments? What can, what ways can I go deeper into a relationship with you so that way I can relay these things back to these students, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's the fun part about it is it, it grows us in that relationship because right. it urges us to go deeper mm-hmm. beyond where we're at. I love how you put that because one of the greatest avenues for spiritual growth is serving in ministry. There's the best way for people uh, to grow um, because what, what you're doing, you're fulfilling the command to grow. Like spiritual growth is a command from Lord, from the Lord. It's not an option that um, is for believers. It's a command that God gives us. And the way that we fulfill that command is by locking arms with the local church. And mm-hmm. I'm choosing to serve, serve the kingdom by avenue of the local church. Yeah. So, it's a cool yeah. thing, man. Hey, one thing uh, before we close, I, I, I did want to mention this because I think it's important to recognize um, going back to the sabbatical thing. So I know I mentioned earlier, but I just want to press into it more. Like sabbatical is not just seizing from work and, and resting. Um, because I know, like I know that that's not afforded to a lot of people. And I just want to again express how grateful I am for a church and for servant leaders that allowed me that opportunity to 
to get an extended amount of rest. <laughs> but in in my resting, what what I discovered in seeking the Lord through reading His Word was I started to keep a journal. Mm-hmm. And every morning I would write three things that I was grateful for. And at the beginning, they were very short, very quick. I'm, I'm grateful for the sunshine. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for an extended time to spend with Crystal. But as the days began to progress, like that writing turned from one sentence to a paragraph, to a full page. And it helped to be even now to be intentional in recognizing moments to be grateful for. Um, and so that's a key thing, I think, in, this, in experiencing a Sabbath rest is recognizing uh, gratitude Mm -hmm. um, and seeing the areas in which God is at work. Even in areas that are hard and difficult, you can still see God at work if if you're, if you're searching for him. Uh, And then, man, I'm grateful for the extended time I got to spend with Crystal. We, I not only grew in my walk with the Lord, but I grew in my marriage to my wife. It was really good stuff. And so you look like you're trying to hold back a cough. No, (laughs) I'm trying to, but I'm very grateful for the extended time I got to spend with her. Um, and like when it was time for me to come back to the office, I remember that night before she was like crying. She's like, I'm going to miss you so much. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, but yeah. you know, she, she had just gotten used to, uh, to us spending, spending all the days, the days together. And I will say this, cause I know again, some people can't stop what they're doing to take a sabbatical for a whole month. But what we can all do is find moments throughout the week to find rest in the Lord, to seek him, whether that moment is for a couple of hours or a whole day or a whole weekend, we can all do that. Yeah. Um, and I think if, if this, this is what I think, if, if I had been intentional to do that, then maybe just maybe um, I would not have ended up um, dealing with, the massive anxiety that I've been dealing with. Yeah. But God's faithful. All things work for the good of those who love him, who live their life in accordance with his good, pleasing and perfect will. And so, man, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up. I'm powered up. I'm ready to move forward, man. And kind of, kind of close. I think, I think at that cohort that we just went to as well, like, like Clint Presley, I think he, I think he hit it really well when he talked about like balance and control in life. Never going to happen. Right. Like get that out of your mind. Yeah. Like you're never going to find balance. You're never going to be able to fully control it's gonna what shift happens from season to season. Exactly. Like you're, you're never going to have that, but there are points throughout your day that you can try and manage well. Yes. And, you know, I think he summed it up well when he said, you know, in the morning, if I can, manage my time wisely and spend time intentionally with the Lord mm-hmm. and in the evening be intentional of spending time with my wife and doing things with her. Yeah. Then like I can handle the rest. Right. Like I'm ready for whatever else is going to be thrown at me. Cause I got God and I got my marriage hooked up Amen. and we're good to go. Yeah. You know? And I think, I think it's, it's touching to me to hear, you know, not only did my relationship with the Lord grow, but my marriage grew because of it as right. well, because I feel like outside of outside of the ministry that God has given us here at the Grove mm-hmm. and family, like those are the two most important ministries that we have. Right. And to me, family is the most important ministry you're given. 100%. You know, and if, if those aren't being taken care of, mm-hmm. then everything else that's built upon it is a house of cards. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So good. And I am grateful for a wonderful staff. Yeah. That was one thing that um, when I took the sabbatical, that was one thing I didn't have to worry about was, um, is the church going to be okay? Because I knew that we have a solid team. We do have a great team here. And uh, I knew that things were going to be okay. So the mission and the vision doesn't change and it kept going forward. Mm -hmm. And so I'm grateful for that. Grateful for you, brother. Grateful for you. Glad you had a good Sabbath and uh yeah good sabbatical amen it's glad to have you back though yeah but, I'm, I'm glad to be back too <laughs> <laughs> but well anything else i think that's it well episode four in the books and yeah glad we're back
We're glad that you tuned in to the Church Door podcast. And so uh, do us a favor. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, uh, be sure that you hit the like button, drop a comment, uh, drop a review. Uh, just let us know how we did. If you got any questions, you can always reach out to us. Uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Church Door Bo- Podcast. And you can all follow up. My tongue. My little, 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 that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is. You can follow us on Instagram at the Church Door Podcast. Or at Reach the Grove as well. It's great to see y'all. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Drop a word of encouragement down in the comments if you liked it. We'll see y'all in the next episode. All right. My ears hurt so bad for these stupid things. I think that was pretty good, Eric. I thought so too. I thought that was really good.